Welcome to the Garage Heroes and Training Podcast. I'm going to be one of the hosts for this episode. My name is Vicky. Who else is hosting? Oh, stop that. Oh, my name is Bill. Oh, Vicky. There you go. <laughs> stop it's us that. again. It is. Uh, Miss Vicky, we have a guest. Yes, we do. We've only talked to him for 40 minutes and we haven't even started recording yet, but that's okay. We have a plan now. We've got a plot. It's going to be awesome. Three Pedal Mafia, we're coming for you. Um, So he is the owner of Fast Sideways, which is a... Uh, it focuses on teaching car control, which we'll talk about what car control is and, and why I think it's so important. He is also a contract driver with Toyota. He has been a stunt driver, a former Skippy instructor, a sim racer, and obviously he's got nothing else to do because it seems like he's everywhere, everything, every time. But for some reason, he gave up some of his more life and he's on our podcast. So we would like to welcome Nick Romano to the podcast. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Vicky. No worries. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. This is one I was looking forward to a lot because car control is, is I think, more important than people think it's important, even though they probably think it's important. So that's my opinion, but we'll see. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So Nick, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So um, my name is Nick Romano. Uh, I've been a uh, an avid racer basically my whole life. Um, I started pretty young. I wasn't a cart kid, but I was a quarter midget kid. I was on the the oval race path for quite a long time, um, did pavement and did dirt. And then some point uh, along the way, I was shoved into a Formula Ford and I was mm-hmm. told, you need to get experience on road courses. And, uh, and so I did. And at some point, um, as I was becoming an adult, I started admitting to myself and maybe to, uh, <laughs> to my family that really it was road racing that that interested me more. I, I like touring cars a lot. I just, I like sports cars and I like the idea of building a car into something that you can race because then it's not just about the driving. Uh, it's also about the build and about the tuning and that sort of thing. And so that's sort of the direction that, that I've taken. Uh, and I've done a lot of NASA and us touring and just kind of road based car racing and that sort of thing. A lot of time attack, um, uh, but uh, basically, since I was nine years old, I've never really gotten out of a race car of some some form or another. I've always managed to figure out some way to stay behind the wheel and, and keep doing it. Uh, and I've been coaching since 2009, probably, is around where I started. Uh, as you mentioned, I was a Skip Arbor instructor for, for a number of years. I worked for exotics racing. Uh, I've done coaching for a bunch of different track days, HOD, um, and a lot of private coaching. And throughout all of this and coaching all these different people, I kept finding myself saying many, many times, you should really get yourself out to a skid pad and practice some car control. And they'd always say, great. Yep. Let's do it. How do I do it? And I'd say, ah, I have no idea. (laughs) There's no good. There's no good solution. There's no good. (laughs) You you either have to go rent a skid pad by yourself or with some friends to try to mitigate costs. And that's really expensive. And then you don't really have any structure or know what you're doing, you'd have to then bring an instructor with you. Or you could go to some other form of driving school that has some element of car control training, but that's like 10% of the larger picture. Uh, And having been one of the instructors at those schools, I knew firsthand that it was not nearly enough time to really be able to use any of those skills. You might be able to learn what you want to learn, like figure out what it is that you're trying to learn, but not really be able to actually use or apply any of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So after, after having that conversation with people a bunch of times, I kept saying, you know, I should really just make my own thing. And then it took a couple of years, but eventually I just kind of said, you know, why don't I? And and so I did. And that's fast sideways. That's awesome. So um, I, I think part of the, the thing that, I find when I'm instructing or, or with our team, because I, I kind of shepherd a little bit with our team as the kind of the manager, a, a lot of the uncomfortableness that our drivers experience is due to what I believe is their lack of confidence in their car control. Like they don't want to cross the line because they're not sure they can bring it back or catch the car. And that was one of the reasons I was very excited to have you on there. And hopefully we'll be able to talk you into coming east because, you know, you're very far away. Um, 
and all our cars are here and you're all the way over there. Um, but we'll figure that out. That's, that's a different plan. Um, but, but I think that the car control, the confidence you have when you know you can control your car and you know, you can catch your car and you know that whatever up to a limit, your ability to deal with whatever happens is, is part of the thing that holds people back from pushing to find out where the limits are. You're a hundred percent correct. Yes. And hear you, that, you, hear that, Vicky? A hundred percent correct. All right. Well, <laughs> I've got a new drop for this podcast. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can we can just end it there, right? You got yeah, pretty much. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. But I'm <laughs> great. Great meeting you. <laughs> so the way that you just put that, uh, you said that people don't have confidence. They're they're nervous because they don't have a confidence in their ability to catch the car. Well, if you don't, all if you haven't already practiced and have the ability to catch the car, you should be nervous. You shouldn't have the confidence mm-hmm. to try to push hard because something bad is probably going to happen. And mm-hmm. at best, uh, that means you will g- get in like a tank slapper and lose a bunch of speed and maybe lose your confidence for the rest of the session. And if you're endurance racing, that could be a really big problem. Uh, and at worst, you might end up off track, upside down or in a wall. Um, and obviously none of those are good things. So, uh, so what people end up doing is because they realize, this is most people, some people don't realize this, uh, <laughs> but, but because they realize they don't know what to do if they go past the limits of the tires, they must always give themselves a, a buffer. You can only mm-hmm. drive up to seven tenths or eight tenths or six tenths or whatever it is, mm-hmm. because if you're driving at nine tenths or 10 tenths, you're going to accidentally get to 11 tenths. Yep. You didn't mean to, but maybe you accidentally entered a little bit hotter than the previous lap, or maybe your tires are going away, or maybe somebody put some gravel down in a corner, whatever the reason is, or you just made a mistake, whatever the reason is, you're going to accidentally drive a little bit harder than you meant to for one little brief moment of corner, and then the tires are going to start to slip. So you can't drive at nine tenths because you're going to accidentally hit 11 tenths and and slide the tires. So you have to drive it eight tenths or seven tenths to give Mm -hmm. yourself that buffer that even when you do accidentally drive a little bit harder than you meant to, you're still not overcoming the the grip limit of the tires. So that's leaving a ton of speed on the table, a ton of speed on the table. And um, so that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that that car control I have found is just so incredibly important. It gives you the ability, not just to slide a car around, but it gives you the ability to push a car harder without the fear of having problems arise. I had gotten so much when I did my uh, skid pad training and it was like a little mini autocross course, but um, it basically was teaching you how to slide the back end of the car. And I, I, I got so much confidence out of that because now it's like, Oh, that's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. Because, because you don't know what it feels like until you're in it. And sometimes it's too late. (laughs) Because <laughs> you don't know what to do. But this way, it was so nice that now it's like, oh, that's how the car reacts. That is, that's, you know, in, in the seat of your seat. Um, that's what it's supposed to feel like. That's what the pause feels like that everybody keeps talking about before you can catch it. Now, it's yeah, you, very valuable. You said a great word there, which is react. And I want to talk more about that. But but first, I want to, uh, so you mentioned the pause. So what you're referring to there is the second letter in, in a three- letter three word string, which is known as CPR, CPR, exactly. Uh, CPR for your car. And mm-hmm. that stands for correct pause and recover. And those are the three steps for what your hands need to do to catch a slide. It has nothing to do with your feet or the pedals. It's just, mm-hmm. that's just all hands. Um, and so the pause that, that Vicky is referring to, that's how long you hold the correction in for. And mm-hmm. that's going to be different every time. It's going to be different based on the car you're driving, the tires, the surface, the speed you're carrying, how far beyond the limit of the tires you are, how much momentum you have. It's this infinitely variable thing. Uh, and so you had mentioned the word react. And I'm going to say that reacting is the wrong approach. Mm-hmm. Okay. Me too. I'm with you, man. Good. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, st- we're still at 100%. That's right. right. Still going. Still going. Because if, if it, hopefully you haven't listened to our first couple of years of podcasting, but um, Vicky used to refer to how when she first 
got started and she was still very early learning. She used to refer to how she finally conquered it and she knew exactly what she needed to do. I didn't because, say that. I knew exactly what I needed to do. Because I said the I was car figuring was, it out. The car was just it was like it was on rails and it was just what were you calling it when you when you floating. Turn, floating through the turns and there were and the right. car would just go exactly where she wanted to. And and I'm just sitting there going, You're not slipping the tires at all. And no. she, she didn't know she should. And sometimes, you know, you don't no. know what you don't know. So it was but, just but a development. I, I think what it was what, when I referred to it as that way, it was driving the track. And obviously I wasn't driving the track at speed enough, but it was driving the track and feeling like the car knew where to go. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it, it the best lines of the car to where the car doesn't have to strain itself. If that but, makes any sense. But that was very, very early on before I'm like, you know, oh, I'm supposed to make the, the tires sing. I'm supposed to to make them make noise. That's that's different. Um, and that's when we had the apex put in the car. And then I was starting to actually feel the limits of the car. Mm -hmm. I think it might have been Mario Andretti who said, if everything feels in control, you are not going fast enough. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and we weren't. Right. So so now <laughs> now my thing is that. I say a lot of cuss words because I'm pushing myself a little bit much because it's scary. So like coming down towards the very end of the straight and I have to, to do this, this footwork and I, you know, I'm like, Oh crap, but I'm not saying crap, um, <laughs> you know, as I'm going through the turn because I feel like I'm on the edge of losing it, but I'm not losing it. Like That's it's great. a comp it's a confidence level thing that I'm trying to push through, but it's scary, but it's, it's, it's a good scary. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you, you said you did that, uh, that skid pad course previously, what were you driving? Uh, this is one, another one of the reasons why I got rid of the Miata because it was a turbo and the turbo would keep trying to kick in and you mm. can't. Yeah. So it would mess up on, on the, um, the circle. So, um, it was made it harder. Pads. It, it, it really did. It really did. Um, because it was either stalling or it was, um, turbo would kick in and then she'd yeah and then i would lose the circle yeah you know yeah so, absolutely i know exactly what you're talking about so, and, and yeah the, the lower the speed is the more profound that effect is as well mm -hmm. because if you're in let's say second gear when that turbo spools up now the difference in torque delivery from what you requested mm -hmm. with the pedal from what you're actually getting is huge it but is if you're in fourth gear it's right. a much more dulled effect. Mm -hmm. It's not going to really affect you that much, which brings up an interesting point. And that is you know, a lot of people and maybe yourself included uh, find that car control at speed is more scary and more difficult to car control going slowly around a circle on a skid pad. Mm -hmm. uh, but for, for that reason, and for a number of other reasons, the, the mechanism of car control is actually easier. The mm -hmm. faster you go, the only reason it's more difficult is in your head. Right. And and scary. this is why the circle pad was more difficult skid pad. than it well, what was it was yeah the skid pad but it was a circle skid yeah or instead of going on to the autocross which was almost like a clover leaf because I could get two speed so I had more control over the car because probably the turbo was already doing what the turbo was doing and I was already in it but um but trying to do that circle pad was was it was not welcoming to my car at all Mm -hmm. so, did you did you switch into the other Miata, the ND Miata? Yeah, I did, and it was easier. Yeah, but I had to relearn what I was doing because I was trying to make acceptances for the uh, for the Miata Turbo. Yeah. So. Yeah, at that point, you almost have to you have to kind of game it a little bit, and you have to yeah. say, okay, well, I know it's not going to do what I want it to do when I first hit the gas. So let me hit the gas, count to three, and then it's going to go. So you have to try to like guess. Right. Well, I, when I, I, yeah, wheel. I'd have to really kind of go in the circle more times to kind of get up to where I needed to go to make it do things that I wanted it to do. So mm -hmm. when I hopped into the car that didn't have a turbo, I had to relearn everything because it, it reacted differently. So it, it was well, a thing, but well, you know, part doing the was... clover leaf was a lot easier because I was able to like slide that car all the way. I'm like, Oh my God, this is so much fun. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, to to be fair, part of it that also was difficult was we were very, I can't remember if we were very early in the season or very late in the season. So mm -hmm. they didn't want to turn the water on. So it was kind of a mix of wet and dry. Mm. Yeah. So the combination of a wet and dry a skid pad that, that needed a little love in terms of new pavement 
and wet and, and uh, the turbo made it, you know, pretty tricky for Vicky. Yeah, it was tricky. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was a good time. Though. Not an easy no. car to start in. No, no, not first no. day. Yeah, it, it, uh, yeah. Like I said, with that car, I I just kind of felt like I was at a uh, a frustration point, like a like a like a point when I just couldn't break through that ceiling, and I didn't know what to use it for. It, you mm -hmm. know, so I'm like, it was very emotional moment for me. I'm like, I love this car, but you know, it's just it's not the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, but anyway, um, but you know, like I said, coming out of that, I can't say enough how much that improved my racing just that one day doing that yeah one day of frustration even right. it wasn't even you know at the time it probably didn't feel like you were you were no. gaining that much but mm -mm. but when you got to the track it probably was just oh immediately immediately right. obvious right well it's like now i know what the limits of the wheels feel like you know now i know what i'm supposed to be feeling and you weren't versus... scared of it no, I wasn't scared of it. I'm like, I know how to catch this. And now, you know, sometimes I just find that when like I have an idiot driver in front of me and it's like the car control kicks in, you know, or you can probably see what their car is doing before they know what's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> you yeah. can predict the future. Right. Yeah. So it, it was, it was pretty amazing. And, you know, a lot of it, you know, the correct pause, you know, react is um, it's very sensory based. Yes, I would have to say, yeah. So but, I want to go back mm -hmm. to that word that you used because I noticed you used it again of react. I know, mm -hmm. but what what is it? So it's, it's correct. Recover. That's what I mean to say. Recover. Right, um, but but um, but but you're referring to reacting to the car doing this and reacting to the car doing that, that sort of thing. And, and I mentioned earlier that I that I think that is the the wrong approach. There's a better right. way to do it. And that is not to be reactive, but to be proactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I was kind of alluding to a little bit when I was talking about uh, gaming it in your, in your turbo Miata. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but Bill, you also mentioned that the surface was partially dry and partially wet mm -hmm. and it made it more difficult because you, you were never really quite sure what the car is going to do, where the, the surface is changing, the grip level is changing. Yep. Um, but the good news is, although you can't ever predict 100% what the car is going to do, you can get pretty close. Right. You can make educated guesses and assumptions based on your knowledge of what's happening. So one for, in one instance, there's the turbo. You know that when you first hit the gas pedal, your torque demand is not going to match the torque output. And then it's going to come on a second later or a tenth of a second later, whatever the case may be. You don't have to be surprised by it when it happens because it's going to be fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. you, so you can learn to adjust your inputs to match. Maybe you don't begin your steering correction the moment you hit the gas pedal. Maybe you hit the gas pedal and you know it's going to be a beat and then you begin your steering correction because that's when the rear end is going to start to come around. And then in the other example of the partially wet surface, well, you can see the surface. You can see where it's dry and where it's wet. Um, and when you go from a dry surface to a wet surface, you know the grip level is going to change. So you don't have to be surprised when it happens. Um, and whether that manifests as the front tires beginning to slip and creating some understeer or the rear tires beginning to slip and creating some oversteer, um, you can be prepared for it. You know it's coming, or at least you know it, it could be coming. So your, your inputs can be ready. Your hands can be ready to make that quick adjustment on the wheel. Or your foot can be ready to release a little bit of throttle if the, if the, uh, the front tires are, are slipping a little bit in that understeer. So yeah, so again, it's not that you can predict 100% what's going to happen, but you can get pretty close, maybe 90%. And then if you take that idea and extrapolate out to a full racetrack, um, I'll use Thunder Hill as an example because it, uh, it has uh, turn three on Thunder Hill East, which is this incredible crest into an off camber right hander. Mm -hmm. um, and so the grip level, especially on entering that corner, is, is really low because the car's super light and, and you lose the camber at the corner. But the good news is, it's the same every lap. Mm -hmm. And it's in the same spot, right? It it's doesn't in the move. same spot. It yeah, doesn't it move. doesn't move at all. Okay. So every time you get there, you don't have to try to drive it with the, a normal amount of grip. You can dial back your aggression a little bit, dial back your speed and, and your input mm -hmm. to match the grip level that is available. And maybe you're three inches to the left from where you were the previous lap. So it's not exact, mm -hmm. but it's close. We can get to 90%. And then the other 10%, that's where car control comes in because then you're just sort of playing with that level of grip is the, is the car telling me that I'm right on that limit or is the car telling me that, no, I've actually got some room left to go. And I could, 
add a little more energy to the system is the way I put it. And that could be that could be either adding more steering and getting more of the turn done right now, or it could be adding more throttle or there, and therefore speed and doing the same radius with a little bit more speed. Either of those I would classify as adding energy. Hmm. Nice. So um, I like to ask this question to everybody. What do you tell yourself or or students or... Uh, anybody that you're working with when driving, do you have like a motto, a self-motto, self-motivating motto or philosophy that you speak to? Absolutely. Yeah. Always 100% of the time, expect the tires to slide. Oh yeah. Because if you always expect them to slide, you will never be surprised when they do. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. That's good. So you hear that, everyone? That's your next step, my dear. <laughs> I've, that been one? I've been yeah, trying to good. get you there. That's your next step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you take that idea and, and run with it a little bit further, um, you can use that to figure out how close to the limits you really are. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, let's go back to Thunder Hill. Turn two at Thunder Hill East is this incredibly long left-hander. It feels like you're in it for minutes. Um, and it's pretty much a consistent radius. You're not really accelerating or decelerating. So it's a great corner to experiment with the limit of your car because you have to hold it at that limit for such a long time. So if you're in the middle of this corner and you just pause time and you, you take a snapshot and you say, okay, well, I'm going pretty fast, but I don't know if I'm at the limit or not. And you ask yourself and you ask the car, am I at the limit right now in this moment? And if the answer to that is no, then your job as a driver becomes how do I achieve the limit in this moment? Uh, and let me back up for just a moment here. So I, I mentioned always expect the tires to slide 100% of the time. That's how you know if you're at the limit. If the tires are not slipping just a little bit, I'm not talking about drifting, but just, mm -hmm. just a tiny amount of slipping or rotation, which I know you've talked about a couple of times on your podcast. Maybe we should get to that soon. I hope um, so. We, <laughs> we can't get it straight. <laughs> <laughs> So if the tires are slipping half a degree, that could be the front tires, it could be the rear tires, it could be all four, then that is a pretty good indicator that you are indeed at the limit of grip. You cannot add more. If you were to add more, the tires would slip more and you would go off your line, maybe just a couple inches, maybe a foot, maybe you end up in the dirt. Uh, but, but if the tires are slipping just a little bit, then you know that you're at the limit. If the tires are not slipping at all, then you should be disappointed because that means that there was a little bit more speed left on the table that you were not yet taking advantage of. So it's important to know what it is exactly that you're feeling for. Like, how do you know if you're at the limit or not? Um, and that comes down to people call it seat of the pants. Um, so that's, that's what you're feeling in the car uh, from, from the seat. There's also what you're feeling in the steering wheel. Uh, there's some very specific things you can feel for. There's the sound. Uh, Vicky, you mentioned earlier, you want the tires to sing. Mm -hmm. not, uh, and that's scream true. not well, scream not scream exactly yeah right you <laughs> um, so you can you can attribute uh, a certain sound to a level of mm -hmm. aggression so like we, we as racers we call it nine tenths or ten tenths those are like different levels of aggression of, of how hard you're pushing the car so mm -hmm. a seven out of ten might make a certain noise it might not even sing it might just sound like friction like almost mm -hmm. like wind, wind noise of the tires mm -hmm. scrubbing on the ground. Right. Uh, rumble. A rumble, exactly. Um, whereas a nine out of 10 might be where they start to sing and get that little bit of a high pitch squeal of the tire actually uh, slipping across the ground a little bit. And a 10, 10 out of 10 might sound different and 11 out of 10 might sound different than that. Um, and it's different depending on the surface, depending on the tires and the car and all these different factors. But if you, this is a great lesson that I, that I use for a lot of my students when we're on track. Uh, if you take a session to just focus on the way these different levels of aggression sound, then you become much more adept at using that information to your advantage, even if it's subconscious. So you, you spend a session consciously thinking about what these levels of aggression sound like. Mm -hmm. And the better you get at that, the more you focus on it. Later on, when you're not focusing on it, you're still hearing it. And that information is still coming in mm -hmm. and you're using it to your advantage, even if you don't realize you're doing it. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and I mentioned this before earlier, I, I wasn't able personally for me to get there without having that visual cue on top of it, which I got from the Apex Pro, because mm -hmm. it did let me know if I was driving to the limit of 
track slash tire, the grip level. I think that's what the apex does. It gives you a grip level, right? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. But that really helped because it, it, it gave me like a comfort level to, to like a visual to the sound. But then I discovered that I was depending on it too much because it wasn't until the apex wasn't in my car when I was just like, Oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You know, so I depended on a little bit too. So I had the apex pulled from my car because I wanted now to depend on that sound versus um, a visual on top. Yeah. The sound and feel versus the visual on top of it. Cause that apex might not always be in a car. <laughs> That's right. It might, it might not. Right. And so, so I, you know, I haven't actually used an apex yet. They, they look mm-hmm. awesome. They look like a great they really tool. are. You should, you uh, should come out to a, a race with us. We'll let you use ours. It's fine. They're a great yeah. learning tool. <laughs> they're a great learning tool. They are. I like them in the, I like them when we do the endurance racing too, because mm-hmm. then you can kind of see how we're doing as a team. And then mm-hmm. I can also uh, skulk around on my phone and find out how you're yeah. doing and, and monitor, <laughs> you know, min speeds and turns and where they occur. And, you know, we can, we can look at things and see how each of the drivers are progressing. So, mm-hmm. so, so I haven't used an apex, but I do use an aim, an aim all the time, right. with the pr- uh-huh. predictive timing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and just like the Apex, great tool. It can tell you if what you're doing is working, if what you're doing is not working, that sort of thing. The Apex just takes it steps further. But it can also be a crutch. And, yep. yes. and it's a great tool as long as you're using it to develop your internal Apex or your right. internal AIM solo. Um, and instead of just looking at the feedback that it's giving you on the screen, thinking about, okay, well, I see that it liked what I just did that improved my lap time in this sector. What did I do and how to, to make it tell me that? And, and how can I give myself that same feedback in the future where, where you can develop your ability to say, Ooh, that worked. That was good. And I guarantee even without seeing the number that that improved my sector time. I, I, won't, I call that the internal aim. I won't say that we've put an apex pro in a car and put black tape over it. So people couldn't see the lights, but I could in the, in the pit stop. So it was fine. <laughs> it works. All right. So I think we've succeeded in the world's longest intro. And we've talked about what we're going to talk about, but we never really said what we're talking about. So in your opinion, Nick, we talk about car control, but some people, especially people who are new or thinking about getting into the sport, they may not have any idea what we mean by car control. They may think that means, you know, steering a car and not driving into a wall. And, and yes, that's part of car control, but I think we're talking about a different aspect of car control. So if you were to define car control in terms of a high performance driving venue, how would you talk about car control? Sure. So in this context, car control is a driver's ability to manipulate the balance of a car at will. That's part of it. And what I mean by that is for instance, take an understeery car and get it to rotate, get it to be less understeery. So that's manipulation of the balance of a car. That's that's one part. It's also a driver's ability to overcome accidental tire slip and keep a car on its intended path, no matter what is happening underneath you. By which, so what, what is happening underneath you? Like you hit a patch of oil and the rear end steps out or even the front end steps out. A, a, a car controls the ability to manage those issues and keep the car on the path that you want it to be on. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Vicky? Are you a 10 out of 10 for car control yet? No, (laughs) no, but it's it's not for lack of trying, you know, this or interest. No, not for lack of interest. No, not for lack of interest or trying. Uh, um, This is probably the thing that I see you get most excited about. You don't really seem to care about going fast, like 110 versus 120. No, But car control seems to be the thing that tickles you. Right. Because I know that once I have car control, the speed will come. Mm -hmm. So I focus on the, I'm just, I really focus on the technique more than the speed at this point. I mean, I go fast, but, you know, making sure that I have those things and then increasing speed over time is is what I do. I do it in increments. So I'm like, oh yeah. Especially um, when I got comfortable in the BMW and I had the apex in, I was starting to feel that that car is so balanced. Oh my gosh. It is so balanced driving it around. And then you don't realize how fast you're going and doing it with the car. I mean, between that and the Miata are just two completely different beasts. They really are. Um, 
but I was doing what I was learning much faster with much more control in the BMW because it just felt more balanced. And I was able to play with the power. The, the Miata um, that I drive, you really kind of have to work up the speed. You just, I mean, it always feels like running a Miata at a really, really high speed is work. But for the BMW, it really wasn't. It just would go because it had so much horsepower. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, so in a Miata, if you if you get some tire slip, <clears throat> of course, tire, tire slip is friction. So it's right. going to slow you down. Mm -hmm. and you don't have the ability to get that speed back in a Miata like you do right. in, in an M3 or, or even a 330. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be so much more precise in the Miata and not allow the tire slip to get beyond maybe a degree mm -hmm. because that's the point at which you start to lose all that momentum. Right. So, so it, it rewards you for being very precise, but it also punishes you if you're not. Right. Um, now compound that with the short wheelbase. So when mm -hmm. it does get tire slip, it happens real fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and yeah, it's just, it's a much more difficult. It's funny because it's one of the, the best cars to start out tracking in for a mm -hmm. lot of, for a lot of reasons, but it's also one of the most difficult cars to learn car control in uh, for a lot of the same reasons. Interesting. Right. And, and the BMW, you know, it's got a good amount of torque. It's got a long wheelbase that plays a big role as well. A long wheelbase gives you more time to feel and then respond to different things that the car is doing. I never really thought about it that way. Yeah. I never really, I just know that when I lose momentum, I really have to work to get it back. And then working in a Miata, it just feels like, especially against the bigger cars, you have to take your chances in the tight spaces when you can, when they can't. Mm. So you gain your ground in your turns, you gain your ground in your short spaces. Um, and then, but, you know, on the straightaway, you know, you just have to do what you can do to, to get where you got to go. That's, you know, so I guess, precision comes in you don't want to mess up those tight areas because you just lose all your momentum right yeah that's the frustration of being in the the low power but really good handling car in a racing scenario you might be able to put down incredible laps when you're alone but now when you're when you're dicing wheel to wheel the high power but low corner speed cars can absolutely ruin your corners mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can do nothing about their straightaways no. you no, can't ruin you can't. their straightaways no and I think that was that was the huge difference. I felt I felt confident in the E36 at the time. It was an E36 that we were doing it, or was it E40? That was E46. It was depends the, on where you're. It was the midnight car at because uh, I was was using it at Mid Ohio. Oh, that was the E46 M3. Yeah. Yeah, and I couldn't. I just couldn't believe. I'm like, you know, I was afraid of the car at first because I had so much horsepower. Yeah, I had to talk her into driving it because she was scared of it. Yeah, but well, it ended up being way easier, right? It, it ended up being easier. It really did. It was really smooth. The way it was put together was really smooth. Yeah, those E46s uh, it, are, are really incredible cars. It's just, it's, it's a sweet spot between width, wheelbase, power, torque, and mm -hmm. linearity. Mm -hmm. The linearity of the throttle and also of the steering. It's just everything, it's, it's where it's supposed to be. Everything reacts the way you expect it to. Nothing is surprising. You're not having to go drive around weirdness. Right? Which is why you see so many of them on the track. Yeah. Yeah. Like in your turbo Miata, you were having to compensate for weirdness. Mm -hmm. Or if you're driving like an SW20, a second generation MR2, you are compensating for the weirdness of that car. And you oh, can drive one very a, fast. That's such a right. fun car though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, mid-engine cars, there, there's something very special about the experience of driving them. And, and, and I, since we're talking about car control, I just remembered. Yeah. <laughs> um, Is that what we started? Oh, no. Oh, wait, yeah. what? I thought we did that already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since we're talking about car control, a mid-engine car or a rear-engine car benefits even more from rotation than a front-engine car does. Uh, so it's simultaneously more difficult and more reliant on, on these techniques that we're talking about. Wow. Mm -hmm. That was my second car, I think, was it? 91 MR2. So I had a good time. Oh, very yeah. nice. It was good. They've, they've got quite a reputation, but uh, I don't, I didn't find that to be a problem for me. I mean, you know, I don't know. Well, it's funny. Okay. So people, people want to talk about this thing called snap oversteer. Have you heard of this before? Oh yeah. No, lift I lift off I... oversteer, snap oversteer. Yeah. got them both. It you can, you can exist. refresh me. It doesn't exist. It's fake. It's false. It's not a real thing. How, how so? Why, why do they say it? Snap oversteer is a result of a driver not responding to what a car is telling them. 
Mm-hmm. Snap oversteer happens when a car is understeering and the driver does not respond to that understeer. Mm-hmm. And then that understeer very quickly becomes oversteer. Oh. Which is why somebody would call it a snap. But it's not the car's fault. It's, it's not... they're snapping. <laughs> right. Yeah. But they're not <laughs> snapping. It's not that an MR2 has a bad snap oversteer problem. <clears throat> it's that uh, the driver was ignoring the car's plea for help. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, the front tire's plea for help. Uh, and, and if they had just uh, listened to what the front tires were, were saying and, and responded to that and given the front tire some more of that grip, the car would rotate in a much more gentle and predictable and usable fashion rather than all of a sudden and all of a sudden is always a recipe for, for disaster. Yeah. I was, when I was driving it, it was, it was the, the non-turbo, just the base one. And I always found it to be more likely to four wheel slide than front wheel. Like it, it, at least the one that I had, you know, if it was going to do something else, it would have a little bit more rear than front, but it was never, I didn't see the problem. I never, I couldn't understand how people got into the problem. Poor driving. Okay. Yeah. Well, poor okay. driving bill. Well, it wasn't me. But, but so also, I'm happy. No, no. It's, I mean, it sounds like you're doing the right thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a combination. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm offending some of your listeners. right no, now. No, you're not. That's <laughs> okay. fine. We, we do all the time. We worry. all learn. It's all so about it's, learning. It's a combination of the setup of the car, the tires on the car and what you do with that car. So mm-hmm. if, uh, and, and different people, you know, some people are, are more adept to feeling the tires just naturally it comes to them easier. And some people, they have, really have to work for it. Um, I've never met anybody who's incapable of doing it. They just, some people just have to work harder at it and don't have a natural sense for it. Well, so some, of, some people just are just more analytical. Like hubby here is way more of an analytical technical driver and he uses more visual cues. And he, I wouldn't say that he he's a sensory person and for better or worse sometimes because sometimes right. the analytical drivers have a much harder time wrapping their head around car control because it is the least analytical thing and it's a hundred percent feel but right. vicky you say that about bill but it right. sounds like when he was driving that mr2 he had some of that feel because mm-hmm. a four-wheel slide will only exist if the driver is responding to a two-wheel slide Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is if the rear tires begin to slip a little bit, the driver must transfer some of that load, some of that ask to the other two tires that are not currently past their limit. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like, Bill, you were doing that in that car. If you're, not, if knowing, you're not, not knowing, not knowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, so I, I think that I think the thing that drives Vicky a little bit crazy and in, in, is I tend I love to be. You. <laughs> well, among them, among the things that drive Vicky crazy, I tend to be very analytical and I, I tend to prepare a lot. But when I get behind the wheel, I try and usually succeed in forgetting all my preparation and just drive what I see. <laughs> so I have a plan. I have, you know, uh, various things that I'm using for alignment and targeting and, and various, you know, this is what I need to do. And I have a plan. But when I start to drive, I tend to try to forget the plan and just you know respond to mm-hmm. what's going on so it's it's a little bit of a mix and it's probably more if i'm prepared if i'm not prepared then i'm just a i suck it's yeah. you just don't want to be there well, once yeah. you're actually out on track driving in that session whatever you did or didn't do to the car you got the car that you've got you've got yep. the tires that you've got and the track that you've got and whichever driver can better adapt to the situation and deal with it and extract speed from it is going to perform better on track. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, there, there, there was once a race car driver. You may have heard of him. His name was Ayrton Senna. Uh, oh yeah. He was pretty good at this. He, he, he did. Okay. You know, he, I mean... he did all right for himself uh, in, in car control. And I often use him as an example to my students in classes and I'll, I'll compare him and his rival slash teammate, Alain Prost, mm-hmm. because Alain was, the analytical driver and Senna was the seat of the pants driver. Mm-hmm. They both were ridiculously talented, extremely successful. They both won numerous races in every, every year that they were driving. Um, but they had a very different approach to what they were doing. However, there is one thing, well, there's many things, but there's one thing in particular that Senna is extremely well known for. And that is how well he performed 
when conditions changed or when conditions mm-hmm. were bad. Yep. And that's because, especially when conditions are changing, there is no amount of preparation you can do that's going to tell you exactly how the car is going to behave now that the conditions are, have changed because you don't know exactly what they're going to change to. So if you're reliant on the analytics, if you're reliant on your plan and knowing exactly what you're going to do before you do it, uh, your plan has now gone out the window. But if you're relying only on what you're feeling from the car and creating this, this relationship, this, this bandwidth of, of data transfer between the driver and the car and the tires specifically, if that's what you're reliant on, and if that bandwidth is very fast, if you're getting a lot of information from the tires, then you can adapt to any situation, any change of environment or grip level or whatever the case may be, extremely effectively and be fast no matter what's going on. And, and that was probably Senna's strongest suit. And um, the, the race that he did in, uh, I think it was, was it, uh, I think it was in England. I don't remember uh, exactly which track it was, but he went from like mid pack or, or back of the pack to first in like a lap and a half. Yep. Wow. And this is, this is the highest level of motorsports, the best drivers in the world and the best cars in the world. And somehow this one dude is able to extract that much more pace out of a car given exactly the same parameters. Yep. Wow. He was magical. Yeah, absolutely. So I, th- I think one thing that um, we've talked about around it a couple of times is the proactive versus reactive. And I'm, and I'm not quite sure we've been clear enough for our listeners mm-hmm. and, and Vicky um, yeah. <laughs> to, by what you what you mean by that, because I, I think I know what you mean and I have a, a I'm sure it's just a version of what you mean, but perhaps we could we could uh, expand on that a bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So a reaction is let, let's let's talk about it in a, in a specific scenario. So let's say you're going into a corner, you get on the brakes, you trail break into the turn and the rear end begins to slip. A reactive driver will say, oh, no my rear tires are slipping. I better do something about that. And hopefully if, if they have practiced, they will start to turn the wheel into the slide. There's the, the correction, the C and CPR, and, uh, and hopefully they'll catch that slide. But they haven't done that until after the car is already five or 10 or 20 degrees sideways. Um, mm-hmm. And so at best, they're gathering up what could have been a spin and hopefully, you know, not losing a ton of speed and, and moving on and, and maybe catching whatever cars passed him in that situation. A proactive driver will get on the brakes, same situation, get on the brakes, turn into the corner, trail break in, and expect, know that because they are transferring weight onto the front tires and off of the rear tires, it is highly likely that if they're carrying the momentum that they hope they are, the rear tires will begin to slip. And as the rear tires begin to slip, not after, as at the same time, they're taking several degrees of steering out to match the amount of steering that the rear end is doing. So if the rear tires are slipping, you can think of that as the rear tires are steering the car. And let's say to make this corner, you need 20 degrees of steering. Well, if now the rear tires are performing five degrees of that steering, the front tires must now only perform 15 degrees of that steering because the total steer still has to be correct. If you want to stay on the same radius, mm-hmm. if you if you have 20 degrees of steering in the front and you add five degrees of steering in the back, you're going to end up on a tighter radius. The car is going to dive towards the inside. That's why it's called oversteer because right. you're steering more than you intended. So if you can always have the front steer be an exact match or an exact opposite to the rear steer, you can exactly keep the car on line, even if the tires are slipping. So, um, uh, and this is a, this is a gradient. So if, if you go into the corner and you know, like I said before, always hundred percent of the time, expect the tires to slip. If you're expecting them to slip and because you're doing these things, because you're coming in with a lot of momentum and trail braking, it's pretty clear that it's going to slip. You can begin to take some steering away or take that a step further, not add as much steering in, in the first place to compensate for what you already know the car is going to do. I think a really extreme version to witness, and I think it really just kind of blew my mind, was drift racing. Mm-hmm. 
I she'd had, never seen it before. I've I've heard like I didn't I thought drifting was just like drift racing was something like a little time trial that you would see like in a parking lot and people were just drifting. When you see it on a racetrack and see how they control and, and it granted there's a lot of slide that's going on, obviously, and there's a lot of just skidding, but that's car control right there. Absolutely. That was amazing watching them go through and do so that. So let's take that example. So the rules stay the same. Let's mm-hmm. say they're drifting a corner that requires mm-hmm. 20 degrees of steering. Mm-hmm. The rear end is doing 40 degrees of steering. Mm-hmm. So the front end must do negative 20 to keep the car right. on the correct radius. So that's the counter steer. They're, mm-hmm. they're steering, not not just you know taking some steering away but they're steering actively into the corner to compensate for what the rear end is doing right so front steer plus rear steer equals total steer they needed 20 they had 40 they took 20 away from the front they're going where they wanted to go wow you're not there yet Vic. no no <laughs> no but i i you know i i really have to say that i think that that was the one time i think my mouth just dropped when i watched them do that it, I it was really like, is. that is amazing that people can do that. Now, granted, they, they whip through tires and they blow engines, but holy cow, that was amazing. So based on what we've talked about so far, it sounds like your next project car should be like a totally beat up 1993 Nissan 240SX. Ooh. Maybe with a welded differential. Don't give and... Bill any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, look at Bill. He's like, <laughs> yeah. He's going to Craigslist right now. Oh my gosh. We I I find better cars on Facebook Marketplace, but you know. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. He he was very much like, you know, I'm kind of interested in in Sunday Cup. I'm like, you know what? That sounds next thing you know, we got two Honda Fits show up. I didn't have any part in that discussion. I'm just like, oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good problem to have. Cars keep showing up. You get to play around with them. It's not a good problem to have. (laughs) (laughs) She she's the she's the mechanical one of us. She freaks oh, out every time. Do yeah, I'm like, I don't, I don't have the room in the shop right now. <laughs> it's a fit. It needs no, this much room. It's fine now. It's, it's good. It's the name. It fits. We, exactly. we, got it all, we got it all worked out. <laughs> That's right. So, so you just discovered drifting. Yeah. And and was it Formula D that you were that you watched? No, was that Grid Life? Grid oh, Life. Grid Life. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Grid Life at Lime Rock, and you're like at the top of the hill, so you're looking down on the cars. Hmm. So you get a full view of what they're doing in segments of the track because you're just, you're above them. You're, you're looking, so you can see, you can see the cars doing what they're supposed to be doing as if they're watching it on television. And I I was floored at the car control amount of car control that they had doing that. It really is pretty incredible when you consider that they're not just doing it by themselves either. They're doing what they call them tandem runs where, where they're judged based on how close they can get to the other car. Uh, including like touching doors, like that's considered a, a highly skilled. If you can, no, they weren't doing that at Grid Life. <laughs> oh, they weren't. Okay. <laughs> no, they, 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 they were, but you didn't see it. It's fine. Oh, I don't uh, but but in in drifting, it's not really drift racing because racing would imply that you're trying to get to the finish line first. Mm-hmm. This is more like automotive figure skating, right? And I, and I don't mm-hmm. mean that in a disparaging way. I mean mm-hmm. that it is uh, it's a judged sport, so it's based on skill style flair, um, Mm -hmm. accuracy, all these sorts of things. But have you ever heard of Jim Connor? No, I have not. Hmm. She doesn't listen. So Bill, you've heard, you've heard of Jim Connor? Yes, sir. Uh, so Jim Connor was popularized in the U S uh, by a gentleman named Ken block. And he made a, a series of really cool videos where he is uh, essentially drifting around in a, uh, a four-wheel drive, super high-powered car. Um, now, those are titled Gymkhana. They are not actually a Gymkhana competition. So Gymkhana is a type of competition that's really popular in England, um, where it's sort of a, a, a blend between autocross and drifting. Mm-hmm. And essentially what they're doing is they have the course set up in such a way that the corners are so tight that the only way to get through them with any kind of speed is to intentionally slide the rear end of the car around. Mm-hmm. Um, so this one is a timed event. It's uh, There's different classes of car and you try to get to the finish line as quickly as possible, but you have to do all these incredible car stunts and drifting along the way, because if you didn't, you would be slow. Like for instance, sometimes you'll have to go into a box of cones, 
do a full circle around and then get back out. Well, if you tried to do that with full grip, you'd have to put the car in reverse, back up, do a J turn, go back and forth, five point Austin Powers through, you know, to try to get back out. Right. You lose a minute of time. So the fast way in is to pull the e-brake, which I think is hilarious that that's a tool yeah. for speed, pull the e-brake, get the car to pivot, get back on the gas, do a quick 360 donut, and then zip out the way you came in. Oh, yeah. So, it's like the reverse donut and then spin it around and, and turn your car around. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, at some point when you get a chance, YouTube Jim Connor competition, because it is incredible to watch. Um, and, and I love it a lot because it combines everything I love about racing and car control into one really, really cool competition uh, where you have to be fast, but you also have to have that, that incredible fine level of car control. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. That would be fun to watch. We've got some YouTube homework. Now. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We do. <laughs> it it kind of reminds me of that. Um, what's that one show gone baby? Was that what it was? It was the it was the young kid who was driving the race car. Um, for baby driver. Baby, baby driver. driver. Reminds yes. me about Baby Driver and how he just kind of that was all car control. That was a car control show. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite things about that movie was uh, none of the driving was CG. It was all real. Right. And and really well done. Mm hmm. And that's what kind of remind me of because he was doing a lot of footwork, a lot of leg work, a lot of brake work, a lot of uh, just crazy stuff, and uh, that was pretty amazing. Indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So, so let's see what, uh, what haven't we talked about for car control? Um, I've heard people say they steer their car on track when they're at the limit. They, uh, they don't use the steering wheel. They just use the throttle. Well, if they are driving a dirt sprint car, that might be true. Uh, but, uh, it's, if they, if, if somebody's claiming that they're driving without the steering wheel entirely, they're probably exaggerating a little bit because the steering has to start the operation, but you can continue the operation of making your way through a corner with the gas pedal. Uh, if you do it just with the gas, like you can do it, but you'll be slow. Uh, you'll be at a really high level of angle um, and you're probably going to spin out most of the time or grip up and end up going the wrong direction. So really it's got to be a marriage between the two. It's got to be, uh, the, the, the steering and the, and the throttle have to, have to complement each other. And, and kind of, as I was describing before, uh, whatever the rear end is doing, you must follow it and match it with the front end. Um, right. Because, it, you know, it's actually, it's interesting. If you think about it, if you have slip, in the rear of the car, you actually have more finite control over what the car is doing than if you don't have slip. Because if you don't have slip, you can tell the car where to go with the steering. You can tell it if you want to accelerate and you can tell it if you want to slow down. And that's mm -hmm. it. If you're slipping the car, you can tell the front end where you want it. You can tell the rear end where you want it. You can change your speed, your trajectory, your angle, um, all with the same controls that you had to just tell it fast, slow, and turn. Um, so you, you, you have a much higher level of control. There's many more knobs to turn, which is also why it's much more difficult because there are many more knobs to turn. <laughs> right. Uh, it's easier to make mistakes that way. But um, let's circle this back around to something that makes the car control useful. And that is using it to, uh, to, to affect the balance of a car on the fly. So let's say you have a race car. Let's say it's a, an E46 M3 and it doesn't have any arrow. It's, um, it's just a stock body and uh, uh, it could have race suspension, race tires. It doesn't really matter. You can only really perfect the tuning of that car for a very specific type of corner. And it can be pretty good everywhere, but it can only be perfect in one specific type of corner. I mean, and by type of corner, I mean like the speed of the corner, uh, how much steering input is required. That sort of thing. So if the car is set up to be really fast in low speed turns, when you get to a higher speed corner, you're going to have some level of lift in the back of the car. And that's just a just a, a, a function of the shape of cars. Uh, all cars, I should say all asterisks, almost all cars create some amount of lift, and that's just a fact of life. So as you get to a higher speed corner, you're going to have more lift on the end, the car is going to tend to feel looser. Oversteer biased. So it might have been perfect in low speed turns, but now it's not perfect in high speed turns. And you're going to have to drive a little bit more gently to prevent you from getting oversteer in the high speed stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, 
the flip side of that is, if you tune the car to be perfectly balanced in high speed turns, you've probably added some grip to the rear end, taken some grip away from the front end. Now, when you get down to the low speed turns, the car is probably going to be really understeer biased. Mm -hmm. You can never really have it both ways. But if you are really skilled with car control, you can rebalance the car with your driving rather than with the tuning of the car to compensate for what the car lacks in tuning. So uh, for instance, if I'm building a race car that doesn't have any aerodynamics in it, uh, like my Lexus, I've got an IS300 <clears throat> that, I, that I raced in, in NASA ST. So I tuned that car to be perfectly balanced as best as I could in high-speed corners. And it's kind of an understeery mess in low-speed corners, but that doesn't really bother me because when I'm in the entry to a low-speed corner, I can use a lot of trail braking and I can rotate that car, get it pointed out the other side, mitigate that understeer. And then by the way, because the car is understeer biased, a side effect of that is it has a whole lot of forward bite coming out the other end. So I have mitigated the issues of having that understeer bias car and take advantage of the benefits, both on the exit of that turn and also in the high speed turns. So it's so car control is not just about saving a slide. It's also about being able to perfect the behavior of the car in a multitude of different scenarios, even though that's not possible to do with tuning alone. Hmm. Okay. I've got, I've got this for later in the podcast, but it fits, <laughs> here, it fits here now. We have, we have a problem. We have our John Cooper mini work, John Cooper works mini and it's uh 20 i think it's a 2019 so it's the the newer version and stock tires stock suspension uh camber caster everything um when i take it to the track all it does is push all it just constantly wants when to. did you take you took it to the track early on didn't you yeah right when we first got it yeah yeah and i wasn't i wasn't good back then i'm better now not good still but better so when you're when you're stuck with a car, because you mentioned it earlier, like if we're in a race, you, you get in the car, you're in the race, you do the endurance race. It's not like you can have somebody running next to you and changing the camber while you're out on track. So so how do you adjust for a, an ill behaved car using car control in the case of like, let's say understeer and oversteer? In my case, I'm specifically going to pester you about understeer, but both both apply. Sure. Well, we can talk about understeer first. Um, actually, oversteer is the more simple one. Uh, but we'll get to that next. So understeer. So in your, in your JCW, um, well, the first thing I can tell you is that the biggest problem is probably the camber. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we can talk about setup in a bit. Let's just talk about what you can do behind the wheel. The car is what it is. You just have to drive it. What you can do is take the grip level that you have <clears throat> and move it somewhere that it's going to be more useful. So you have an imbalance in grip level. You have too much grip in the back and not enough grip in the front. And therefore okay. you have understeer. You go into a corner, the front tires reach their limit of traction pretty early and the rear tires still have plenty of grip left to give. They're not at their limit yet. Mm -hmm. You can never have more grip than what you've got, but you can move it around. Uh, and you do that by transferring weight. So if you get on the gas, of course the weight goes from the front to the back. Um, if you get on the brakes, the weight goes from the back to the front and it's going to press down on whatever tires, uh, uh, the weight is going towards. And you feel the same thing on your body. When you get on the brakes, you get pushed forward into your seatbelt. If you get on the gas, you get pressed back in your seat. The car feels, and, and really the tires feel exactly the same thing. So you've got this imbalance in grip. You've got too much grip in the back, not enough grip in the front. What you need to do as a driver is move that grip from the back to the front. And you do that through deceleration. Um, and that can be from lifting off the gas or it could be from braking. They're just different degrees of the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but deceleration is going to transfer that weight onto the front tires. So let's say you're coming into a corner uh, and the car just got this incredible understeer. You can abruptly lift off the gas pedal and, and, a, and quickly transfer that weight from the back to the front. You're taking grip away from the back. You're adding grip to the front. You're rebalancing what the car is doing. And you may even be able to do it enough that it actually turns that understeer into an oversteer. Okay. Um, 
So you could be trail breaking, you could be just lifting off. And by the way, this applies in the middle in the middle of a turn too. Like um, I was talking about turn two at Thunder Hill, that really long left-hander. If you're at the limit of traction in the middle of this corner, you're probably on some maintenance throttle, just trying to maintain your speed. Let's say it's 70 miles per hour, just maintaining, maintaining. If you try to add a little bit more throttle, you're going to transfer that weight to the back. You're going to take grip away from the fronts. So you're going to give grip to the rears and you're going to bias the car more towards understeer. If you take that throttle away, you're going to transfer a little bit of weight forward. And we're talking small amounts here. I'm not saying do a full lift. I'm just saying mm -hmm. little, little adjustments. Transfer that weight from the rear to the front. Make that front contact patch a little bit bigger and bias the car more towards oversteer. Uh, so you can do that in the middle of a turn. You can do that. Uh, and the entry is, is really where it happens most often because you're decelerating anyway. You're on the brakes right. when you enter the corner. And you've already transferred that weight to the front. Um, something to look out for is that the brakes in 99.999% of cars are heavily front biased yes. <clears throat> and, and they have to be because that's where most of the weight is. Even if you're in a 911, that's where the weight goes when you get on the brakes hard. So they have to be bigger. They have to be more powerful. Um, so if you brake too hard and what is too hard, it's kind of a, the goalpost move, but let's just, let's just say too hard for the grip level you've got. If you break too hard for the grip level you've got, you will overcome the, uh, the benefit of transferring weight by asking the front tires to do too much. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two things at play here. There is how much grip is available on any given tire. And there is how much you are asking that tire to do. So by breaking, you are giving the front tires more grip but you're also asking them to do more work. So okay. if static, if static, the tire has 100% of grip available, you can use that grip for one of three things. You can use it to accelerate, you can use it to steer, or you can use it to decelerate. Those are really the only three things a tire can do. Uh, let's say you were in a rear wheel drive car, just, just for example. The front tires are never going to accelerate. So... Uh, by getting on the gas pedal, you are not asking the front tires to do more work. However, by getting on the gas pedal, you are taking grip away. So now your maximum is no longer a hundred, maybe now it's 75. Right. So now you can't ask for a hundred percent of them from steering. You can only ask for 75%. If you ask for a hundred, they're going to slide and that's understeer. Right. So it's kind of this double-edged sword, uh, specifically talking about, uh, about the brakes in, in your, in your mini right now. If you get on the brakes really hard, you are giving the front tires more grip, but you're also asking them to do a whole lot more. And then if you try to steer at the same time, now you're asking them to do 200% and they only had 120 to give. Right. 120 because we gave them a little extra grip with the, with the braking, but mm -hmm. 200 is still way too much. So in order to, so there's a lot of words. <laughs> so let's, let's wrap this back, wrap this thing in a bow here. <clears throat> so in order to take advantage of this concept, you have to give it the right amount of braking and the right amount of steering so that the amount of grip you gave to those tires is not being overcome by what you're asking those tires to do. So if we're trail braking into a corner, it's not going to be very much braking. It's going to be just enough to transfer a little bit of weight, but not ask too much of those tires. You have to give them more than what you're asking for. So on entry, you would brake a little earlier, a little softer and trail brake lighter. And then on exit, you would more slowly roll onto the throttle and open the wheel earlier. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, now in the mini and in a front wheel drive car, there's really not a whole lot you can do on exit. Um, you're just, you're, you're, you're kind of screwed. It is what it is. It is what it is. You're, 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 you're asking the front tires. Yep. You and got yourself like, here. Sucks to be you. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You chose this car. <laughs> exactly. So, so the only thing you really can do is set yourself up for success earlier. Adjust your line, adjust your input so that the front tires have less work to do when it comes time to get on the gas. So it's probably going to be a later but stronger turn in. So you do mm -hmm. more of the steering early in the corner. So there's less steering to do when it comes time to hammer down and get out the other side. Okay. So it's more or less straight now at post apex. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. But, but really the, the fine balance comes on the entry. 
uh, you don't really want to rotate a car on exit. That's kind of sloppy and you're probably losing speed if you do. Really, the magic happens on corner entry when you're mm-hmm. decelerating. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then if it was a uh, a car that was oversteery or... Yeah, that's that's a lot simpler because you can't really fix an oversteer uh, with with weight transfer per se. Because if you get on the, let's say you've got an oversteery car and you're in a, a high speed corner, getting on the gas is probably not going to be your solution. It's going to be exciting um, though. Yeah, it, it's going to be very exciting. It's funny <laughs> p- people say this about about nine elevens all the time. Like, oh, just get on the gas. It's like, well, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. That just maybe. makes the that just makes the uh, body work bigger. Exactly. Yeah. It, it might prevent an oversteer now at the very beginning of the corner, but it might also mean when you do go off the track, you go off the track 20 miles per hour faster than you would have if you just left it alone. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what you can do if you've got an oversteer car is know that you have an oversteer car and be prepared for it and adjust your inputs to match. So for instance, the speed at which you turn the wheel is going to have a big, the speed and how far you turn the wheel is gonna have a big impact on the way the car behaves. So if you know you've got an oversteery car, you're probably going to want to turn the wheel slower, smoother, maybe not as far. Because like I mentioned earlier, um, uh, if you are being proactive, back to the proactive conversation, and you know the car is going to, you know the rear tires are going to slip, let's say on the entry, you may not turn the wheel as far into the corner because you know the rear tires are about to help you. So mm-hmm. the same, you would apply exactly the same thing to an oversteer biased car. You will do less on the wheel to compensate for what you know the rear end is going to already be doing. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So um, what's the difference between street tires and racing slicks? Oh, that's a great question. It, that was that, that. I mean, that's like a legit question for me because I know that the slicks don't have tread, but I don't really understand what their purposes are. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's a great how question. They re, how they respond differently. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to risk going into the weeds briefly, but we'll come right back out of the weeds. I promise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, in order for a tire to function as a steering device, there must always be some level of slip. Uh, that's just the way a tire works. There is the direction it's pointed and then the direction that it's actually going. And there might be 0.1 or 0.5 of a degree of slip angle between those two. So if you turn the wheel 20 degrees in, you might actually only be steering 19 degrees. Mm -hmm. So there's always some level of slip. Now the design of the tire has a huge impact in the amount of slip, in the amount of slip that you have. Uh, A street tire with big chunky blocks, like think, think about like an old school, like the BFG, radial ta or traction mm-hmm. ta you remember those with the big mm-hmm. square rec- chunky yeah those are going to squirm a lot tread squirm is what it's referred to as so that might be more than a degree of slip angle that might be four degrees of slip angle and it's not that the, the tire is not performing the way it's intended to it's just that's how that tire works it might have this big gap between where it's pointed and where it's going and as long as you know that going in you can drive to the tire so mm-hmm. the more slip angle a tire needs, or the more, let me, let me back that up. The more tread squirm a tire has, the more slip angle you will need to drive with. Does that before, make sense? Yeah. But before we go further, especially to our audience who are new drivers, explain what slip angle is. Oh, sure. Oh well, yeah. So, so, so that's what I was just talking about there. Slip angle is the difference between where you point the car and where the car actually goes. Okay. So, right. um, and, and it's really cool, actually, when, when you get to the point where you're driving with slip angle, you actually have to turn into a corner like two feet sooner. Okay. Because the car is going to float over the pavement and not actually, yes, exactly. So the floating that you mentioned before, <laughs> that's totally a real thing. And if you get a chance, both the two of you and anybody who lis- who's listening to this, watch some slow-mo video of especially uh, early DTM mm-hmm. races mm-hmm. and NASCAR on road courses. Okay. Great. Because those two, there's a lot of video available, including slow mo, and they both exhibit this float really, really nicely. And you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You can actually watch the tire 
uh, slide over the surface. The car is still going where the driver is pointing it, but it's floating on its way there. And so everything has to happen slightly sooner. Now you asked about street tires versus race yes. tires. Well, that's, that's, that's a, okay. That's a big, that's a whole spectrum. podcast by itself, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's a big spectrum too, because there are all season street tires and there's high performance summer street tires and there are Hoosier really fancy race tires and there are bias ply vintage race tires and they are all going to behave really differently. Um, so whatever tire you have on your car, you, you basically just have to drive to what it wants. So the challenge then becomes figuring out what does this tire want? Uh, every tire, I don't care what it is, if it's a professional race tire or a, a, a bargain bin uh, all season, has uh, wants a certain amount of slip angle to be fastest. Every tire is fastest at like 101 to 104% of its quote unquote available grip. Mm -hmm. uh, so to, I'll talk about a couple of, of popular tires. The Nitto NT01, really mm -hmm. popular track tire, 100 tread wear, road legal track tire. That thing, for whatever reason, loves slip angle. You have to drive that thing sideways. If you don't, it's slow. If you drive it sideways, it's fast. That's just the nature mm -hmm. of the tire. The uh, Maxxis RC1, direct competitor to the Netto NT01, hates slip angle. You have to be precise. The more precise you are, the more speed you can get out of the you can get out of the tire. Um, and the, the line between street tire and race tire is actually really blurry, especially especially recently, because there are all these two hundred Trevor Street tires. Um, uh, just to real, really quickly explain what that is, if, if somebody doesn't know. So um, tread wear is, is, uh, is stamped on the side of every tire you can purchase, whether it's a race tire or street tire. And what it's actually a measurement of is how long the tire lasts. But the, op, uh, but the side effect of that is the, the less time a tire will last, so the lower the number, so a 200 mm -hmm. or 100 tread wear tire, probably also has a lot of grip on track. So if it's a high number, 600, it's going to last a really long time on the street, but it's probably not going to have a lot of grip. Low number, 100, 200, it's got a lot of grip, but probably not going to last very long on the street. So that's tread wear. Um, and manufacturers have been playing these funny games with, with the, the, the numbers on them. And at the moment, 200 tread wear street tires are faster than any 100 tread wear tire available on the market. And that's because oh. of market demand. Uh, they because lie. They lie, exactly. It's because of autocross, really, uh, because there is really competitive autocross classes that require you to use a street tire of 200 tread wear or higher. So the manufacturers, because this segment is large enough to get the manufacturer's attention, they produce these what are called uh, cheater 200s <laughs> that say 200 on the side, they have treads, but they are faster than any of the 100 on the market. Um, so, so a, it's actually we have a whole garage one. full of those. By the way. Uh, yeah, Which yeah. ones are they? All of our tires. Oh, okay. So some of the fast ones are like the uh, the Bridgestone RE71R was like the cheater tire for a long time. Uh, we just, just ordered the RE71S. Yeah, the RS. That's the new yeah. one. I haven't gotten to try it yet. Um, it's the king right now. house right now. <laughs> the king right now of the 200 uh, treadwear is the Yokohama AO52. That's the current top of the heap cheater Cheater 200. Um, che to cheater 200. Yeah. <laughs> cheater. But interestingly, because these are 200 tread tires, they have those tread blocks. So they're going to require more slip angle than the slick 100 tread wear tire. Um, so, so remember I said earlier that you can never predict 100% exactly what a car is going to do, but you can get to kind of 90% based off of predictions. The same is true of tires. You're never going to know exactly how a tire is going to behave, but if you know that it's a 200 tread wear tire, uh, it's in this cheater 200 category, and it's got these big tread blocks, you can be pretty sure that you're going to have to have a fairer amount of slip angle, but it's going to have a lot of grip, but also it's going to heat cycle like crazy. And you probably got one good lap before it overheats. Mm -hmm. And you move them out of your non-climate controlled hanger and put it in your climate controlled area for the winter exactly yeah. <laughs> yes. yes so uh, a better selection of tires to learn from um what do you think crap crap 
crap tires to learn on. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Walmart I agree. specials, baby. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're um, taking HPDEs, you're not going to be burning through tires all day. I mean, if you're going to learn. Yeah, there's a, there's a common misconception that you have to have this like super well prepped car before you can go to the track and start doing track days. It's not true at all. Um, you need to make sure your car's safe, make sure your bearings and your ball joints are in good shape, make sure your brakes are up to the task. Those are really the most important things. And, and uh, but as long as the car is in, in good condition, and it's safe and it's not going to overheat, um, then uh, you can drive a stock car on track. It doesn't need to have anything mm -hmm. special. And the, and the same goes for the tires. You don't need a special tire to drive on track. And in fact, if you put on a Cheater 200 or a 100 treadwear tire or, or an even faster race tire, you're, you're really hurting yourself because you've got this incredible amount of grip uh, that's going to band-aid any mistakes you make. You're not going to hear the tires making noise. You're not going to hear a 7 tenths or a 9 tenths. You're not going to hear the tires singing. Uh, if you, you know, make a bonehead move and just floor the gas in the middle of a turn, uh, the tire will have all this extra grip available and it's going to say, yeah, that's fine. Give me some more. When in reality, if you're anywhere near the limits of the tire, that wouldn't fly at all. Uh, even if it, even if you're at the limits of a Hoosier, um, you, you can't make a move like that. So uh, you want to avoid band-aiding uh, uh, your, you, you want to avoid um, hurting your learning process by giving yourself too much grip. So I recommend starting on some, some cheap tires uh, and, and side bonus, they'll last longer. You won't go through them nearly as fast. Right. So HPD one Hoosiers. <laughs> Definitely not, not recommended. Okay. Yeah, no, no, not, not recommended. Just, uh, whatever, whatever kind of tire the car comes with is usually a great, um, a great tire to start in. Cause especially if it's something like, um, like a new GR 86, uh, you know, that comes from, from the factory with uh, a Michelin pilot sport. Mm -hmm. That's a decent tire. That's all the grip you're going to need to start out. Um, and there've been multiple cases where I've had my students, you know, pack up their good tires, go buy some cheap junk and do some track days on those. Cause you'll hear what's going on. You'll feel what's going on. You'll recognize the mistakes you're making and, and not just the mistakes, but the things you're doing right. And plus, so, so a student of mine uh, has an S2000 uh, and uh, he had just some cheap Toyo I think they were summer tires, but they weren't like track tires. They were like 400, 500 tread wear, just normal street tires. And he went out and found some other S2000s with a similar, similar level of prep, but better tires. And he made it his goal in these sessions to chase those cars down because it forced him to, to figure out where they were missing out on speed and where he could get closer to the limit of his tires and carry speed uh that they weren't able to carry even with their better tires mm -hmm. and then if this guy goes and puts those cheater 200s on his car and does exactly the same thing he's gonna dust them he'll be so much faster mm. that sounds like fun yeah so if if you were to say we, we covered tires right the, the best way to learn is to to get some relatively lower grip tires um so you can learn to control what what would you say are there are there good tracks or bad tracks to go to is a skid pad the way to go is an autocross the way to go what would you recommend before all we talk to you the, before we talk to you about coming to the east coast and right. doing all yeah. of your, one of your events that uh, you know we we've got no intention of doing that before this podcast is over <laughs> what what do you mean um, <clears throat> all of the above <clears throat> um cross training is is a great thing to do um and uh I, I recommend getting yourself to a skid pad before you've spent years building bad habits on the track. But it's also probably a good idea to go to a track once or twice before going to the skid pad. So you can at least get some concept of, of a racing line. Because even on a skid pad, a racing line is important. The line might be a little bit different than on a racetrack, especially if you're just going around a circle like you did, Vicky. But there mm -hmm. is still a line. The line is the radius. So, uh, understanding the order of operations, when you're going to break, when you're going to turn, when you're going to get back on the gas, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so one or two track days before you get to a skid pad, but, but don't waste time, get to a skid pad soon. Um, and all these different disciplines, whether it's track days, skid pad, autocross, drifting, gymkhana, rally cross, all these things, you can learn valuable skills that you can translate over to any one of these other driving disciplines. Okay. Uh, what about 
the car that you're trying to to learn in. We talked a little bit about it, but there's there's obviously models, and, and you might be biased towards one particular brand, and but there's also the the rear wheel drive, front wheel drive, four wheel drive, all wheel drive. Does it matter? Yes and no. <clears throat> it matters, but it doesn't. So car control is car control, no matter what kind of car you're in. Weight transfer is the same, no matter what kind of car you're in. The details are different, but only when you get back on the gas. Up to the, right up to the point that you get back on the gas, it's the same. Um, so talking about <clears throat> front front drive versus rear drive. When you get on the gas in a rear wheel drive car, you could achieve oversteer if you are asking more from the rear tires than what they have to give. That can't happen in front wheel drive. You will never get oversteer on the gas in front wheel drive. You can get oversteer off the gas or on the brakes. In fact, a well set up front wheel drive car is generally really, really loose, really oversteer biased to try to compensate for the fact that it wants to understeer naturally. So like your, your mini, for instance, uh, when if that car was set up as a full-on race car or a time attack car, it would have freaking beefy steel girders for springs in the back to try to get it to rotate and get the back end to follow the front end. Uh, but to but but yeah, the car, car control is the same in terms of weight transfer, and no matter what kind of car you're driving, but the details are different. So for instance, if you come to my class in a Mustang, that's a really simple front engine, front heavy, rear wheel drive car. That's going to be a very different experience than if you come to a class in a Porsche 911, which is a rear heavy, giant rear tire, probably open differential car. That's an incredibly different set of parameters and will require some different inputs from the driver. Now, the concepts are the same. We're transferring weight. We're using throttle to maintain a slide. We're using CPR. Those concepts are all the same, but the speed at which the slide begins or the aggression or the momentum in which you, the momentum you need to create the slide, those things will be different. Mm. I think I got that. Yeah. It's it, the rabbit hole goes deep. <laughs> does. Does. I keep looking for carrots. They don't seem to be around though. That's all right. Miss Vicky. The importance of kids and teens learning. I find it to be very important personally. Control. Yeah. Yes. yeah, absolutely. So from experience of being a teenage boy with a rear wheel drive car, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I wanted to learn car control. Uh, and the only option I had really to do that was rainy parking lots in the middle of the night. Right. Uh, or, and or I, if I got, you're out here, you can get snowy parking. And lots. you can Those still get in trouble. And you can still get in trouble for that. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. I got uh, talked to by a member of law enforcement on uh, yeah. numerous occasions. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but I really wanted to learn and for a number of reasons, because it's fun. I also just wanted to get better. Uh, I mean, it was, I was already into motorsports at that time. I wanted to learn to be, to be better, to have that car control. And I didn't have any other way to figure it out. I didn't have an outlet for it. Um, and, you know, it's, there's there's a thing that's been happening i think more recently with these sideshows which i mean if you get right down to it it is sort of a uh car control display or maybe a lack of car control display mm -hmm. uh but it's it's the same story as street racing if there's no place to do it legally uh and safely or affordably also that's a, another problem then mm -hmm. people are going to do it anyway they're just going to find their own way to do it and that's kind of what sideshows are people want to learn People want to know how to do car control and drift and slide cars around. And if there's no way to do it, know where to do it legally, safely, and affordably, they're just going to do it on the street, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really gives a, a lot of uh, car communities bad names because they all get kind of lumped together and, and put into one. So, um, yes, I think I think it's hugely important for their own safety, but also for um, for the, because they're going to do it anyway. And if they have a place to do it where they can learn to do it the right way and they can learn to do it safely and not endanger people or uh, get themselves tickets or arrested or right. get their cars impounded or anything, it's just, it's just better for everybody. Well, we had two incidents, instances that had shown up in our lives. Um, they weren't 
my children. But um, the first instance was a a girl that I had run across at one of the stores and it was snowing out. And she was dismayed because she couldn't take the car to go to work. So she had to be driven. And, and uh, I said, you know, you just be really careful going home. She goes, oh, no, I, I'm not allowed to drive. She was like, like 17, 18 years old. She goes, no, I'm not allowed to drive in the snow because it's really slick. And I'm just, I was just thinking in that instance that that is a real disadvantage to not because because kids are taught how to drive but they're not taught how to control a vehicle and a lot of things driving is only part of it but there's a lot of things that happen on the road which cause those kids to get in accidents things that pop up instances where a car cuts out in front of them they don't know what to do you know and just slamming on the brake sometimes just doesn't do the job you know it doesn't stop something happening from in front of you and the other instance was someone as a girl that was driving, it was a girlfriend of my son's at the time was driving a deer ran out in front of her and she didn't know what to do. And she ended up ditching into the car. I mean, she ditched the car in a ditch because she had lost control of the car. But it's, it's, um, if you have the ability to take your child to a car control clinic, um, there is some advantages and, and, you know, we recommend one called breaks. Um, and I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, why we're discussing this because they do take kids it's a free program if it's local to you and it does take your children um who are learning to drive and teaches them car control on top of it and it they'll like um put plastic over the wheels to simulate ice or they'll put you in wobbly goggles to simulate drunken driving and make you drive through a course so they give you these instances, but car control is so much is I, I really find to be so important when it comes to kids learning just the instances of when things pop up in front of you and you don't know what to do. Yeah, that, that, those are great examples. Yeah, um, the, uh, out here in California, Thunder Hill, they have a program as well that's exactly what I think it's exactly what you're describing. Where it's let's get as many new drivers, as many kids out to experience it in their cars and, and go through the basics and just give them, put them in these scenarios now so that mm-hmm. if they experience them in real life, it won't be the first time. Right. It's not right. like they're going to be perfect the time when it does happen to them, but at least they'll have a sense of, oh, I did this before. Exactly. Or, right. They'll have some kind of thought to instead of like, oh my God, a deer just ran out in front of me. I don't know what to do and spin the car out or something, you know. There's a, when I worked at Skip Harbor, there was a really cool exercise that we did called we called the the lane toss mm-hmm. um and so there were three lanes delineated by cones <clears throat> uh, and in the middle of these lanes going horizontally across there was a gap big enough to put the car in so you could change right. lanes there at the very end of the lanes there were three for each lane there was a a, a traffic light mm-hmm. a red and a green and uh the the student would have to drive down the center lane, mm-hmm. get up to like 60 miles per hour, 65 miles per hour. And right before they got to the opening, the instructor would hit a button and change the lights and one would go green and they would have to last minute make this right? lane toss uh-huh. to go to the next lane. Now it, we start them at like 40 miles per hour mm-hmm. and it'd be fairly easy. You have to do some quick thinking, but you could get the car over there and it wouldn't be a big deal at 60, 65, 70. The only way to change lanes that quickly is to use car control, right? To get off the gas, transfer weight to the front. It's the only way to get the front tires to respond fast enough to even point the car. Now you've solved one problem, but you've created another one. Now that you've Mm -hmm. done that, now the rear tires are sliding. Mm -hmm. So now you have to be able to respond to that and do so while still telling the car to get into the lane that you told it to without losing mm-hmm. control. It's a really, really challenging, but incredibly useful and effective tool. I think another one that was taught, I know one of the other car clinics, I don't know if it was taught at Liam's car clinic for his brakes program was going at speed and then braking to land in a box. Mm-hmm. So you know the distance of how much brake and brake control that you have. So in the instance of, oh, you know, things are going to happen and you slam on my brakes, you'll be able to know how much distance you have allowed to do that, you know? So, I mean, 
out there for all of our listeners, I mean, if you have an opportunity to go just one step beyond for your kids, it is an invaluable um, resource to to make your to know that that your kid is one of the the better drivers and safer drivers out there versus just hopping in a car with kids that just kind of know how to drive. You know, I think my son did it like twice. And then we actually had him. And I think what Bill was saying too, is that when my daughter starts to learn how to drive, we're going to put her in HPDE situation. So and even though it's on a track or even like a skid pad or something like that, she'll know how to do things to control it. There's a huge value in knowing what the actual limits of grip are mm-hmm. just, just on the brakes, even right. how many people, especially new drivers have never hit the brakes hard and have absolutely no idea what the car will actually do. Or what happens to your car when you start hydroplaning, right? Or somebody, or somebody stops in front of you and you have to slam on those brakes and you're in a wet situation. So having those skills, just beyond just learning how to drive and getting your driver's license, I, I really think is is incredibly valuable. We had uh, a couple of people at Liam's class when he was there. The, the kids got scared that they broke the brake pedal because it started vibrating. Right. <laughs> like, uh, no, no, honey. I broke the car. <laughs> no. no, it's, it's no. fine. <laughs> and the other, thing that, the other thing that we did too is that um, with my son, because uh, – just because he's a boy is that we knew through the program of how he was driving through the insurance company program that they had for when he was learning how to drive. We did that, but we told him that, listen, we're going to take you to an HBDE and we're going to take you to racetrack scenarios. Um, So you can get your adrenaline junkie out to go do these things. Well, that was just the environment that we were in. So we had an opportunity to do that, but they have like these little one day courses. Um, they're called like, uh, was it road, not road America. What is it? Uh, first track, night America, track night, in America, track night in America. It's really inexpensive to do. There might be one local to you and it's just, you can go there after work. Um, and it's during like a, like a midweek or something like that. It's not very expensive at all to do at all. But I mean, if you have, particularly like if you have a kid that has, you know, that you're kind of worried about, you could take them to something like this and give them a place where they can go ahead and get a little loose if they wanted to with their car and learn car control at the same time. So especially if you have like an adrenaline junkie kid that suddenly is behind the wheel, you know, say, if I find you doing this, we will not be doing this, but I'm going to give you an outlet to get that out and we can use that almost like a reward system mm-hmm. for being good we'll take you to the track if yeah. you're doing well we'll take you to the track if you don't get any tickets or if you don't have whatever we'll take you to the track you know and you just spend like after work you just go out to one of these local tracks to you and they do it uh here at uh, sonoma raceway you know i'm not sure if they still do it but they did for years they had 45 five dollar drift nights mm-hmm. on every every wednesday night or every second wednesday night but you bring a car and yeah. go drive it. It was it was really inexpensive. It was a ton of fun. The first that was the first two drift events I ever did in yeah. my stock 1.6 Miata mm-hmm. with an open differential. <laughs> yeah, perfect drift car. Uh, oh yeah, that's everybody's perfect drift car. Um, but, and autoc- uh, autocross is another good inexpensive place to take your kid who's learning how to drive, and mm-hmm. that's a, that's that's an inexpensive day on a weekend it could be another reward system for good driving and car control i'm sorry i didn't mean go ahead you finish she's called bulldozer (laughs) for a reason i am i am (laughs) oh um i was just gonna bring up one more example that was uh, at irwindale speedway in southern california they they have uh, a burnout box oh nice it just basically whatever you wanted to do at a sideshow just do it exactly exactly the same thing right here Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) That's good. Okay. Before we start talking you into coming to the East Coast, I've got two questions. <laughs> it's going to be really hard to talk me into it. I'll tell I know. You I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I, it's going to be tough. I'm going to, I'm going to promise, uh, I'm going to promise lots of stuff and we'll, we'll try and talk you into it. Um, I, I believe I was listening to you on a, another uh, podcast and you had a, a story about uh, a Thunderhill 25 event that you were in. And perhaps there were some brake pads involved with this story. Oh boy. 
yeah, like, quite a few brake pads actually. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just for for the for those of us who haven't heard the the potential of this question, I thought it was worth bringing up. It has nothing to do with car control, but it was too much fun not to bring up. So, so Thunder Hill, the twenty the twenty five hours of Thunder Hill, it's the longest endurance race in the world, I believe. Uh, they do it once a year every December. In fact, I'm, I'm going this year, I'm uh, racing in an E36. Um, but this this particular year, I think it was 2014. I wasn't racing; I was on the crew. Uh, we had a, a prototype Lexus IS. It was the third generation car before it, you could even buy it. Um, and uh, it was a new team. They hadn't worked with each other before. And a lot of mistakes were made. A lot of details were missed, including who was bringing the brake pads. Uh, so the answer was nobody was bringing the brake pads. Um, we had a, a big brake kit on the car. We had the pads that were in the car. And that was it. That's plenty. It's 25 oh, hours. Funny. Yeah. I mean, they last for really years. Need? I mean, you know. So the pads that were in there uh, were prototypes from a company who shall not be named. Uh, and they were supposed to be endurance pads. So when we realized our mistake after the race had started, we're like, okay, well, at least we've got some time to find some pads. Because this is, you know, it's a, it's a big brake kit. So it's a pretty common pad shape. So we were going to find some pads. Uh, about an hour later, the driver radioed in and said, Hey, uh, uh, the brakes feel like they're going away. We got a problem. Well, we still didn't have any pads. So, so the, uh, the guy on the radio said, okay, just, uh, just try to nurse it around. Just, we're, we're still looking for pads. So just keep going, just be gentle. And about half a lap later, the driver radioed in again and said, Nope, they're gone. Pedals to the floor. So he pulls into the, to the cold pit. We look at it and I saw something that I had never seen before and probably will never see again. He had been on the backing plate for so long that the backing plate had melted and the pistons had melted through the backing plate and popped out of the caliper and then fused to the backing plate. It was now one piece of metal. So it was a backing plate that was all deformed with two pistons fused to it and they popped out of the caliper so of course all the fluid left and that's why the pedal went to the floor so now not only did we not have any brake pads but we also had no calipers we had no brakes whatsoever luckily we did have the foresight to bring the stock brakes with us the stock calipers and, and pads and everything <clears throat> so in about 30 minutes we uh we got the stock brakes put back in and and bled and got the car back on our track but now we're in stock pads in, oh an endurance no. race <laughs> much smaller by the way because now it's not the big brake kit oh so, and the next problem was because this is a prototype car <clears throat> there were no brake pads for it we couldn't go to, to autozone and get brake pads they just didn't exist <laughs> so what we ended up doing was we we went to i think it was napa auto parts and we we found their their highest temp brake pad which was like some semi-metallic still not really a race pad and we, we bought the biggest ones they had in that compound. And we bought like a box of them. And we brought it back to the track just while the driver's still just trying to nurse this thing around. And we took one of our factory pads and we drew an outline with a Sharpie on the backing plate of this big pad. And we put, we put it in, I think it was a C-clamp. There was about three or four people working on this at any given point in time. And we got angle grinders and sawzalls and started cutting these larger pads down to the shape to fit into the calipers that we had. But because they weren't really race pads, they would still only last about an hour and a half. So for 25 hours straight, we were uh, constantly getting pads, drawing the, the shape, cutting them, which by the way, smells terrible. I'm sure I've shortened my lifespan significantly from the fumes from this. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the entirety of the race throughout the, the whole night, we're cutting these pads down to fit. And every hour and a half, we'd have to pull the car in and change either the fronts or the rears. We got so fast at <laughs> changing brake pads. We got so good at it. Um, but it, uh, it was a hell of an experience. It's what I've heard described as type two fun which means we were absolutely freaking miserable while it was going on. But as soon as the checkered flag flew and we crossed the line and we did finish the race, it was the most rewarding experience because we had to overcome mountains to get that car to the end of that race. And it was an incredible experience. 
So if <laughs> so if you want to enjoy the fun of endurance racing and potentially become an expert at sculpting brake pads, <laughs> then just don't bring any pads with you. That's right. Just make your own. Just yeah. not a problem. Well, why not? It was it was a good time. Sounds awesome. Sounds fantastic. Good with an asterisk. Exactly. Yeah. Those are the best stories, though. Yeah. We couldn't let you go without that one. That's right. Did, we, I don't think we slept that night either. <laughs> we so were making brake pads, man. Yeah, exactly. There, there's a couple of photos that every now and then Facebook will remind me of. It'll say, remember when you did this and show it to me. And, and then, they're like, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but my favorite one is uh, when we left the event, me and, and my good friend, Joe, who uh, uh, I still race with to this day, he and I were... Um, uh we're the two who were basically on brake pad duty every time the car came in he and i were the ones who were swapping the pads which is why we didn't get to sleep and when we left the event we were just delirious and i think it was like 19 degrees the whole night so it was freezing (laughs) i had a beanie on the whole time and my hair i had hair then was just i looked like doc brown from back to the future and just just the looks on our faces i took a selfie of us when we left the track it's just it's just fun to look at that and reminisce about the horrific situation we put ourselves into, but but how fun it ended up being. It's always fun. Part of endurance racing. Yeah. You're up, Miss Vicky. Oh, you slid that one in? No, I wrote to you and you've not looked at it. No, uh, I've looked. Um, oh, okay. Rain versus dry uh, mm. versus dry track versus wet track. Versus Mid Ohio, <laughs> <laughs> Mid Ohio, which is wet even when it's dry. Oh yeah. my God, Mid Ohio is the craziest track. It's and it's the most fun, but it's the most terrifying at the same time. So I uh, I don't know if you notice this, but I can be kind of wordy sometimes. Um, nope. oh, we love that. it. No, we love it. <laughs> I love it. I'm I'm enjoying this. So here's what I'll say. There's really no difference. The grip level is what it is. You drive to whatever you got. Mm -hmm. Whether it's dry or whether it's wet, it's kind of no different from having race tires versus street tires. You have to drive to the grip level you've got, not the grip, not the grip level that you want. So if it's wet, there's just less grip. You do all the same things. Everything is the same. You just do it at a lower speed. And the car might be a little bit more sensitive to your inputs. It might be more willing for the rear end to step out or the front end to step out, which in my opinion is worse. Uh, but uh, but it's really the same thing. Um, you can do some things to adjust your car uh, to to make it behave better in the rain, especially if you're in a racing situation. It starts to rain. There's some simple things you can do to improve it. But really, um, if you are adept at car control, you already have the tools at hand to adjust to the rain, um, which is the same thing we talked about before: being proactive and uh, maybe slowing down your inputs a little bit. Uh, maybe driving it as if it's an oversteer setup and not turning the wheel as far or as fast so that you're not uh, goading the car into doing something you don't really want it to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. And you lie. Mid Ohio is not the same. (laughs) Oh, okay. So what, so I'll I'll be honest with (laughs) you. Mid Ohio (laughs) is the mid Ohio. They did something in the apexes that makes it, more slick when it's wet Mm. than it should be on every other track so when it when it rains you actually have to avoid these patches that that they have incorporated i think they did it for the f1 racers didn't they not f1 F1, but it was it was uh, i think they it's a combination of multiple surfaces uh a long time since it's been paved and sealant sealer i'm not sure what they call yeah and they but they did this it's like particularly ice. for a level of racing. I think it was but, IMSA. Yeah, I don't know, but it makes it extra, extra slick in the rain. So it's almost like playing when you were a little kid. And I don't know if you ever did this, but it was either like when you were little, you were jumping from surface to surface, sofa to the hassock or whatever, because you didn't want to the jump into touch the, the floor is lava or the sharks are in there. So you can't. That's what it's like racing on this this uh, track, because you have to avoid all these spots as you're going around. So I, I will admit to you that I've actually never driven mid Ohio, not in real life. Anyway, I've driven <laughs> okay. in a sim. Uh, I've, I've walked the track. I, I supported my friend Will there um, when he was racing at the NASA champs a few years back. Um, 
but so uh so so yeah that that is news to me however it's not necessarily news because the rain line which yes. you would do at pretty much any track would have you staying away from apexes anyway it sounds like mm-hmm. it's just even more important here at mid oak yeah usually um when i'm when i'm instructing especially i try and teach you know when when it's raining it's well how wet is it and then we move half a car width or a car width or in middle high it's like the opposite side just go as far away as you can <laughs> and you know just just deal with it and it's it's uh it's special <laughs> so for, for anyone listening who's who's not familiar so when it rains especially mid ohio it sounds like but but at any track wherever the normal dry line is, that's where there is tire rubber and potentially like bits of oil or, or anything or dust. Um, it's going to be on, on the line. And when it rains, when it gets wet, all of that turns into lubricant. Mm. Uh, the rubber down on the track, which normally provides more grip, now provides less grip. So in order to safely get around the track and quickly get around the track, you have to move away from the normal lines. You end up driving a car width or two car widths or all the way on the other edge of the track because that's where most of the grip is now, now that it's wet. So that's the rain line that we're talking about. And, and yeah, if they've got sealant or, or something else down there, it's just going to compound that problem and make it even worse. Mm-hmm. It's, it's super special. <laughs> a special track regardless. You know, Always. Dry. Oh yeah. It's, it's a fantastic, it's, it's just, it's the most different wet to dry that I've ever been on so far. So, hmm. and, I'm, and I'm looking for more. It's fine. It's reminiscent of ice. It's it's awesome. (laughs) So before we start lobbying for your East Coast event, Nick, how would people follow along with you? How would they contact you? How would they learn from you? What's the best way? Well, the first thing I would would recommend doing is is checking out fastsideways.com. There is uh, some some more information on there about what the program is, what types of programs we we have, and why it is helpful, how, how it could be beneficial to you. Um, I also have an Instagram at fast sideways, uh, which is great. If you're looking to, uh, take a course, you can, you can message me on Instagram or you can email me, uh, Nick at fast And that's N I K at fast Or if that's difficult to remember info at gets to me too, info at fast And then I also have a, a personal Instagram as well. It's at Nick Romano racing, um, which is probably a better place to contact me for, Anything other than fast sideways, if you're looking for private coaching or car setup or, or any of that kind of stuff, um, I'm kind of, I got, I got my fingers on all those pies. <laughs> awesome. And soon to be coming to the East coast, if we have anything to do about it. Well, we'll see about that. How good are you at bribes? I'm pretty good. You know, I'm oh. a lemons. We're a lemons team. We're really that's, experienced at bribing. That's true. You're really practiced at bribes. Sorry. <laughs> one more thing I got to mention. I also have a YouTube channel, although it doesn't necessarily have much to do with, uh, with, teaching or anything like that i do have some fun stuff on there with both sim racing and real racing and i uh just some fun challenges like um fast sideways has a car that we use for rentals it's a uh, an 07 mustang gt and when i got the car i gave myself a, a fun challenge i wanted to see how cheaply i could get this car or really any car under two minutes at button willow 13 cw layout so i uh uh did all my modifications to the car to try to keep it as simple as possible and including purchase price of the car, see how cheaply I can get it under, under two minutes. And I, and I did accomplish that goal. And so far, uh, so far, I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty good number. I, I think it'd be tough to beat. Challenge accepted. Yes. Listeners, go get Anybody it. in California. No worries. That sounds like fun. We have people who listen in California. Don't know why, but they do. We, they, we say thank you. <laughs> Excellent, sir. Well, the uh, the episode is over and the lobbying shall begin. Okay. Oh, my God. This was such a good episode. Oh, I have great. to say it was really good. I got a lot out of it. I well, hope everybody it, out there got a lot out of it, too. It's hard for me to tell because, like, you know, 30 minutes into uh, into a rant, I'll realize, oh, my God, I'm still talking. No, <laughs> a, but I have no but, idea what I've said. You know, uh, we're, we're like a car control and getting people on the track is one of the things that we focus on. So this is very, um, very niche for us, for our listeners. So um, a lot of good information came from this. That's right. Oh, wonderful. Mm-hmm. So if, oh, wait if a minute, you wait a minute, yes. before the bribes can begin, yes. go. <laughs> we have to do one very quick, very simple thing. We have to define rotation. Oh, yes. that's true. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, if the listener hasn't gotten a lot out of this podcast, they should definitely uh, delete it. <laughs> re re-download it and listen to it again 
because there, there was stuff in there. <laughs> okay, rotation. We've we've rotation. We have beaten this subject. I think we're on our fifth or sixth time. Solve the problem, please. All right, re yes. real simple, real brief. Hopefully, rotation is very simply uh, when there is tire slip, specifically in the rear tires, that is aiding in the steering of the car. Okay. How would slip in the rear not be helping you steer? If you do not respond to it with the steering, and then it will take Too the much. car in a direction yeah. other than the one you intended. Loopy. But but rotation doesn't necessarily mean you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> it just means that there is rotation. But yeah, but but put very simply, it's just if the slip angle of the rear tires is impacting the trajectory of the car it's aiding in the steering whether that's helping you or hurting you is inconsequential but it's just the slip of the rear tires aiding in the steering of the car what about when somebody i'm going i have to do this what about when somebody says a car has good rotation i don't see that on the the Monroney there you know it does, <laughs> it's not it's not one of the listed options uh-huh so, so it's always confusing. I'm like, the car is sitting still. I'm like, it's not doing anything. Well, a car that has good rotation, uh, it's probably just set up very well. It's probably very neutral because a car that has too much oversteer doesn't really have good rotation because you're probably kind of walking on eggshells trying to prevent it from rotating. Mm -hmm. And a car that understeers a lot, well, you're fighting it in a different way. You're trying to force it to rotate and that doesn't really feel great either. So a car that has good rotation is one that is, is very neutral or really it's close to neutral because there's kind of no such thing as perfectly neutral, but it's close right. enough that with your inputs, you can intentionally, but gently and linearly get the car to rotate to assist your cornering ability. Okay. I think we may not have another rotation episode, but I can't promise anything. We'll see. <laughs> well, invite know. me back if you do. All right. We can do that. You're always mm -hmm. invited back, sir. Yes. Thank you for coming on. And Thank then you. we're about to enter lobbying time. All right. <laughs> Thank All right, you, Let's Nick. bring it on. It was absolutely my pleasure to be here. This has been a ton of fun. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you, sir. Captain's log supplemental. So, Miss Vicky. Yes, sir. Do you remember when we were watching those WRL events and some of those grid life events where you used to see the in car? video and it had like the, the cameras seeing front and back but it also could see all the telemetry and everything that was going on uh -huh. you know most of the ones that we liked were taken by the sentinel system remember james came on our podcast earlier right you know we have no excuse since he uh lent us one for trial and demonstration purposes we should actually probably put that in one of our cars maybe two i really think we should i think we should i know because then we'd look like the uh, immature endurance racing team that we are. Oh, wait, I mispronounced that, didn't I? Sorry, my bad. <laughs> we could so what have, does the Sentinel system do? We could have three cameras with picture in picture. We could have, if we ever get the AIM system to work, open invitation to anybody from AIM to come on and give us a little bit of love. We need some help. Um, and then we could have all our telemetry on there. And then we can have it streamed live into the paddock or around the world to our millions of fans. We're apparently very popular in Kenya right now. Don't know why, but that's fine. <laughs> and it can integrate all the uh, available race statistics from like race here and everything. So we could actually see how we're doing on video. We wouldn't even have to carry around our phone anymore. Live. I love it. From the great halls of their house, there are assembled three who hope to one day be the world's greatest driving heroes. Created from the cosmic legends of the universe comes our team captain, the Vision, Bill Fisher. Their soon to be Wonder Woman, Vicki Fisher. Our Captain Marvel and head flight trainee, Jennifer Scribchuk and our Batman, the master of tools, gadgets, and all things mechanical, our mild-mannered soon-to-be billionaire, Alan Danvers. Their mission, 
to fight injustice, share what is right and wrong, to get you out of your house and come out racing with them, and serve all mankind. They are the Garage Heroes in Training Team. So while we were podcasting, I have confirmed one, two, three, four, five, six, oh my gosh. seven. <laughs> I have seven confirmed and five maybes, depending on timing. That's awesome. <laughs> so one day down, buddy. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So I think what, what I was considering doing uh, to do an East Coast venture is to do one day of skid pad course and one day of skid pad plus full track. Um, so actually I didn't, I didn't really talk about that. So the, the full the track first... or the, the autocross track? Well, I, either one, okay. um, that that's just the name of the class. So there's the, the full day car control clinic, which is just, just on the skip pad. And then there's a full track training day where we have a skip pad and the track, and we go back and forth between the two. So we do exercises on the skip pad and then we apply the lessons full scale on the track. Okay. Well, eventually we're going to bother you on the West Coast, so you have home turf. But uh, we're going to we're going to lobby for you coming out here next year. Well, you don't have to lobby. I'm I'm going to do it. It's okay. just a question of exactly when. Okay, so it's a little bit different from from what we do. Um, so sure. we we are in car the whole time, um, with some exceptions occasionally, depending on the student and, and exactly what's going on, um, but. Uh, but yeah, so we do fewer students, more one-on-one -on -one time with the instructor, but of course it's, it's more expensive as a result. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they had uh, radios. That was about it. Got it. Yeah. 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 So, so when I first started the company, I thought about doing a more introductory course like that, but it, it just felt like one that already exists and two, the, the compromise is really big. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to focus more on fewer people, higher output. Sure. And, yeah. uh, and it ends up making it more expensive. Um, sure. I'm, I'm, I, I have a feeling I know, and it's fine. We'll be there. Yeah. But um, the way I have sort of come to terms with that is when people are trying to get faster on track, they are more than happy to spend $4,000 on a set of coilovers to make themselves faster. Uh, so this is similar except the money you're spending makes every car you drive faster rather mm -hmm. than just the one you put the coilovers into mm -hmm. uh so there's been a a ton of people who have wanted to take the class couldn't do it right away saved up came and took the class right it, it happens all the time uh so i just decided that that's just kind of the way i, I prefer to do it it's more one-on-one -on -one, it's more personal and that's just you know as a someone who came up doing private coaching that was more along the lines of what I had been doing and more what I preferred. Right. I always work personally with each student on making sure that they're, they're ready to go for the class, make sure their car is ready to go. So we generally use dry skid pads, but okay. we use burner tires on the back of the car. I have found that it is easier to get the car to behave the way we want it to um, and more representative of uh, a normal track day. Right, right. So that's, I think, that's generally what we've done. I think the uh, the skid pad at Lime Rock has a sprinkler right in the middle that mm. you can set just to go, mm -hmm. so you can do it either wet or dry. Like I said, okay. we were we did it dry, but it was semi wet, so they wet it with a fire truck every now and then, and then they just let us dry off. Now, are you talking about at Lime Rock? They've got that big circle. Is that mm -hmm. the skid pad you're talking mm -hmm. about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they have a clover leaf that uh, yeah, right off like... to the side. It's like a couple kidney different. Mm -hmm. loops so that that, is that expanded is that the proving grounds you're talking about i think so yeah yeah i'm looking at it on uh, on the satellite view right now yeah. so that's actually not what we'd be using um well we'd probably be using the proving grounds but not that circular skid pad we would probably be using uh the back paddock so just the, the large paved area and set up our exercises there <clears throat> down by the uh the large building towards what would that be the the downhill turn onto the front straight yes i believe that's correct yes okay. yes okay yeah that's that's not an easy walk just fyi uh, a walk to for, uh, to where between the if you're having a skid pad down there and then the proving ground 
that's that's a drive, not a walk, because it's oh. it's ugly topography. So what we'll generally do is set up like a little pit area where people can swap their wheels if mm -hmm. they've got burners and, and normal tires. And then um, uh, we will, if it's just a full track, uh, sorry, if it's just a full day skid pad course and that's near the skid pad and they just drive out towards the exercises we have set up with cones. And if it's the uh, the full track course, we'll generally set it up, uh, set up our little paddock area near the track mm -hmm. and then drive over to the skid pad when we want to do the skid pad exercises. The way that I schedule the events for Fast Sideways is very much uh, as they are asked for. Oh, okay. So, so I don't have a whole schedule of events for the rest of the year laid out or anything like that. It's just if people get in touch and say, "Hey, I'd love to take a class like this," then I keep a I keep tabs on who wants it mm -hmm. and uh, what their schedules are, and then I book to match. Do you ever come east? I haven't yet, but um, I do have plans to. We know we know people. <laughs> that actually that would be excellent uh, what area are you in are you familiar with thompson speed oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah, so oh, yeah. that there's is... a track map is a swamp <laughs> when we go <laughs> so hot <laughs> this, is, this is a track map for thompson right yeah so thompson is uh is probably the front running contender for where i would come in uh, and host a class that would be great because we we kind of, except for one of our one of our team members, that's kind of central. That's so, fantastic. Yeah, we did uh, we did a race there. I think it was like first or second week in August, and it's it's like soup, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm I'm out in California, so I'm I'm spoiled on the, in the soup regard. No. You don't have to deal with much soup. However, uh, in working for Toyota, I end up in Texas a lot, and we were just in Palm Beach, and so. I give, I give my fair share of soup, too. A little, little bit. Yeah. Hey, Vic, what lake is near uh, Thompson? Shargagagag, menchagagagag, chabunagungamag. Yes. That sounds Welsh. Uh, I think Indian. it's Indian. It's Indian. Mm. Yeah, that's that's what the uh, Thompson was named after, and then they changed it to Thompson. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, that it, They changed it to Warren Lake, I think. Yeah. I think the, the guy got tired of typing. They, that was part of our penalties is that we had to say the name. <laughs> <laughs> so i memorized the name so just in case it, it means that you fish on your side i'll fish on my side and we all we both or we all fish in the middle something like that wow yeah so so you're mentioning penalties i'm guessing that's lemons oh yeah, yeah. sometimes lemons we do a lot sometimes of lucky dog sometimes lemons a r and sometime well we're we're starting to next go into grid life Oh, okay. Yeah, we're we're working on entering a Sunday Cup car. Which, well, my yeah. goal is to not my my. You know how you have bucket list, and we'll ask you about yours later. But mm -hmm. my bucket list goal is not to beat Tama or anybody like that. But I want to enter GLTC and not finish mm -hmm. DFL. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if you think about it, if That's you enter good. GLTC, <laughs> you'll be up against literally a minivan. Yep. So I think your chances are pretty good. Yeah. Well, I don't yeah. know. The guy in the minivan can drive, though. So we, <laughs> we, we got some we, room for improvement on our end. A Miata, 99 Miata that I had to get rid of. And and I got rid of it because it was a, a Miata Turbo. Um, Stage it had a two fly, fly Miata, Miata yeah. Turbo. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was a great car, but it was two street for track and two track for street. And <laughs> right. And it's, it, it wasn't comfortable to drive on the street because I had race suspension on it. And so I, and right. And, and then I, I felt everything in it. But then I when I went exactly, to the, exactly what you mean, I have two right. cars that fit that description. I've got a 91 <laughs> right. Miata, which right. has all the horsepower of a 91 Miata. But it has the race all of them? And, in, in yeah. one spot. And I'm telling yeah, you, they're wow. not comfortable to drive in on the road. They're really not. No. But then, no. yeah. And then I went to the track and I felt so limited at the track because the car would get so hot. Mm. That, with that the turbo. I just, I, right. And then I felt so pigeonholed with it. You mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. I couldn't. There's not couldn't. really a series because she does mostly endurance racing. Still, she doesn't do any sprint racing. And that's not right. an endurance racing car with the turbo. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So the Miata that we have now, which after I, we work on the suspension and get the fit done, we have to flip the engine because we blew the engine on, on the Honda Civic. 
um, we're going to start building the spec Miata that's sitting in the garage. And it's identical to the car that I have mm-hmm. or that I just got rid of without the turbo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then is that for SCCA or NASA? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Vicky will take that. She's, uh, she's just starting. Like we, if you're going to choose a, uh, an HPD, we've tried them all in the area and the one we like is not in the area, but we go there anyway. NASA Great Lakes, they're, they're awesome. Mm-hmm. So that'll be her HPD three and four car. And then she'll use it for racing as well. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, here's how the class works. So there's two there's two different main classes that we host. The first is called the full day car control clinic, and that's just on a skid pad. We have a series of exercises that we do throughout the day, and it's limited to only six students. So it's really small, really intimate. That way, most that way everybody gets more of a chance to spend their time actually driving instead of waiting around or in classroom right. or that sort of thing. But right. the, the car is the classroom mm-hmm. and there's two instructors. So it's two groups of three and you just cycle through bang, 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 uh, get in the car with the instructor. And then he gets in the car with the next one and the next one and you're back to you. Um, so it just goes like that throughout the day. And we run through the different, the different exercises, but each person's going to have a little bit of a different experience because you might come with your, your experience and you've driven these cars and you've done these things and you have this amount of muscle memory, this part of it is right. This part of it might be wrong. Uh, and there's and Vicky, more of you, that latter part. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Vicky, you might be coming in as a, a professional LMP two driver and you have all this mm-hmm. other experience mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and you're just trying to get something very specific out of it. So you might progress more quickly. Um, so each person, we, we all start in the same place, but depending on how quickly the student picks things up and how quickly they build a muscle memory, we might get through the lessons quicker. Although the end goal is almost always the same. Uh, mm-hmm. the experience will be a little bit different. That's cool. I, like, I, I, yeah. I think uh, Lime Rock would be perfect for you because you have um, the two separate areas are very close to each other. They almost butt up against each other, but they're separate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you could probably, if you want to have two groups, you could probably have four or you could have one group on each track area. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and in a larger venue like that, especially if we're talking about more people, we might just, instead of doing two groups of three, we might do three groups of three because we've got the space to do it. And that mm-hmm. that way we can, you know, help to manage the costs some more. And it doesn't end up being, you know, yeah. a crazy amount of money per person just because the venue is so expensive. I think we should just stop the podcast. Nah, uh, you get a flight. We'll drive <laughs> over to Lime Rock. And, okay, hold uh, on. Expedia. <laughs> I like kayak, but, you know. Oh, whatever. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Other services are available. That's right. No worries. All right. We've uh we've killed a half hour of your time. We haven't even started yet. Yeah. Um, well, we made room for Jeremy. Yeah, it's true. Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy, you're 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 failing miserably in getting home. <laughs>